Have you got Wimbledon fever yet? I certainly have, which is probably just as well as I'm hosting 13 days of live coverage on BBC television. Now, you wouldn't want to miss a trick, would you? So the Radio Times is the guide to all the action. And if you're working all hours or simply enjoying this great British summer, then you've simply got to get a copy. In an outstanding offer, Radio Times is giving away this three-hour tape to video your favourite programmes while you're away. Yes, that's right. A three-hour tape, absolutely free. Radio Times. If it's on, it's in. Even if you're out. Just take those old records Tom Cruise. Shout. I'm a nice guy and I'd, I'd like to meet you. Ah. I don't want to make a mistake. Jeopardize my future. Rebecca De Mornay. Are you ready for me? Well, thank you for breakfast. It was really good. If we ever got our friends together, we'd make a fortune. Who's the U-boat commander? She told me she'd be my girlfriend. She told me a lot of things. I believe them all. Risky business tonight, 10.40. A moral dilemma faces the casualty department in 20 minutes when religious beliefs prevent a patient from being treated. Now on BBC One, the news and sport with Martin Lewis. The MP Frank Field wins back the right to defend his Birkenhead constituency for Labour at the next election. He beats left-wing opponents in a rerun of an earlier selection process in which he'd alleged intimidation and malpractice. And Ian Paisley says the government is putting the Ulster talks in danger. Good evening. The MP Frank Field, ousted 18 months ago as Birkenhead's official Labour candidate for the next general election, has won back the right to fight the seat on behalf of the party. He took 53% of the votes against 46% for trade union official Paul Davis. Labour's national executive ordered today's rerun of the selection process after the MP alleged militant infiltration, intimidation and malpractice at the original meeting. Today, it was his left-wing opponents who claimed the result had been rigged. Frank Field's hopes were not high when he arrived at Birkenhead Town Hall. He had battled for 18 months against his deselection and what he regarded as the rule of the unions and the hard left. The meeting had been rowdy, unpleasant, Mr Field called it, and as his victory was announced, left-wing party members filed out, calling it an outrage, a stitch-up. As the MP prepared to talk to the cameras, the protests continued. This is the rigged vote, you know it. You're a middle-class intellectual that doesn't belong in this town. You don't know anybody in this town. You don't know Mr Field said all he felt now was relief. It shows that even with a system which the Labour Party now is going to disband, because it's designed to destabilise MPs and local Labour parties, the extremists and militants cannot win. The argument came down to who the National Labour Party decide was allowed to vote and who was not. The vanquished Paul Davis has complained to Labour's ruling body, the NEC, that his supporters were singled out. I hate the idea of looking a bad loser. I didn't like the way uh, Frank Field conducted himself last time and I don't want to appear the same, but some things happened in this meeting today that were absolutely astonishing in terms of who was allowed to vote. The decision in Birkenhead is the least embarrassing possible for the Labour Party. Its enemies can't portray it as the victory of the unions or the hard left, quite the reverse. But it does mean yet another disgruntled constituency party on Merseyside and a row that's set to rumble on for some time yet. An opinion poll being published in tomorrow's Sunday Express suggests a 1% conservative lead over Labour. The Mori poll is at odds with other recent surveys which put Labour ahead. The poll has a margin of error of 3% either way. The poll is an unexpected boost for John Major, who is enjoying England's recovery at Lord's today. The apparent turnaround in his own fortunes follows a series of polls putting Labour up to 10 points ahead. Morris' latest findings have the Conservatives on 39%, one point ahead of Labour, with the Liberal Democrats on 17 A similar Mori poll a month ago had the Tories trailing by six points. The poll was taken after Mrs Thatcher's controversial speech in New York on Europe and the angry response it provoked from Mr Heath. The row sparked by her comments doesn't seem to have damaged the government in the way many Tories feared and the opposition had hoped. The poll seems to buck recent trends because, firstly, of a backlash against Mrs Thatcher leading to a 
swell in support for Mr Major, particularly amongst the middle classes, and secondly, something of a decline in support for the Labour Party, possibly caused by what the events in Liverpool of the past week. The Conservative Party chairman, Chris Patton, said the poll showed Labour had been bragging prematurely. He said the government's position would strengthen further as the economy improved. But Labour's Gordon Brown said the Conservatives had nothing left to offer Britain. He said the Tories were breaking into factions over Europe with no strong leadership. John Major's determination not to be deflected by the row over Europe is supported by clear majorities, both in the Sunday Express and in a Gallup poll on the issue in the Sunday Telegraph. And although his personal popularity has again fallen, he leads Neil Kinnock by 19% when people are asked who would make the best Prime Minister. But Labour, who think the Tory lead is a freak result, will draw comfort from the Telegraph's findings that nearly four out of five people believe the Tories are divided. As Labour remember all too well, split parties don't win elections. Ian Paisley has warned that the talks on the future of Northern Ireland are in danger of collapse. The Democratic Unionist leader was reacting to the announcement from the British and Irish governments that the next meeting of the Anglo-Irish Conference would go ahead as planned, despite the Unionists' objections. The Northern Ireland Secretary Peter Brook decided to make no comments today as he was accompanying Prince Edward at public engagement during a visit to the province. But Mr Brook now knows that this is the worst problem the talks have faced and that the idea of adjourning the negotiations in July and resuming after the Anglo-Irish meeting is simply not acceptable to the Unionists. Ian Paisley is suggesting that British and Irish ministers could meet informally but that if it's at an Anglo-Irish agreement conference meeting, then the talks will collapse. Well, they're going to collapse. I mean, this idea that he thinks that the Unionists are now going to again have their noses rubbed in the mud and they're going to make a concession and, sh and let Dublin see, yes, you're in the driving seat. Well, it's all over. And let me say, the Protestant people and the majority population can't take this forever. So they better beware of what they're doing. Is I have been at funerals during the past two months, and I have found a different spirit at those funerals. A sullenness, a sourness, and a silence. And that silence intimates to me that the Protestant population are about to break. And God alone knows what will happen when they break. Ian Paisley will stay in the negotiations until he's locked out by the decision of British and Irish governments to go ahead with the July meeting. Though Mr Hockey said, after seeing Mr Major last night, that that shouldn't affect the talks. It would be absolutely tragic if uh, anybody were to regard the meeting of the 16th of July as in any way impeding. We want to be as flexible as we can about the run-up to the 16th of July and whatever anybody wants to do after the 16th of July. No one appears to want the talks to fail, but if the current widely differing positions can't be reconciled, then they seem doomed to end without even nearing a conclusion in July. The Soviet Union's first Deputy Prime Minister, Vladimir Shabakov, has said that the Soviet Union would not survive shock therapy and that economic reform must be introduced gradually. Russia's best-known radical, Boris Yeltsin, has arrived back from America into a political argument which becomes more outspoken by the day. The newly elected president of Russia, the republic which covers three-quarters of the Soviet Union, is backing an economic reform plan developed in America by radical Soviet economists. But the Prime Minister of the Soviet Union has his own more cautious proposals for economic reform, which his deputy, Vladimir Sherbakov, outlined to President Gorbachev last weekend. Today, Sherbakov again called for gradual change, saying the Soviet economy cannot survive shock therapy. He said many people fear the country could fall into the hands of greedy capitalists. President Gorbachev is vainly hoping to blend the cautious ideas of his government with the radical ideas backed by Mr Yeltsin. He's almost alone in thinking a compromise would be workable. This dispute at the top of the Soviet government, with the Prime Minister and his deputy expressing open contempt for meaningful economic reform, will make it harder for President Gorbachev to get what he wants from the West. Today, the 50th anniversary of the German invasion which brought the Soviet Union into the war, President Gorbachev appealed for the wartime spirit of unity to be revived, a hollow appeal as long as the Soviet government does not speak with one voice. David Loyne, BBC News, Moscow. Tens of thousands of Albanians have given the American Secretary of State, James Baker, a rapturous welcome in the capital, Tirana. 
Mr. Baker's visit marks the end of almost 50 years of the self-imposed isolation of Albania. Neither the Albanian capital Tirana nor James Baker had ever seen anything like it. Albanians cheering wildly, waving American flags and holding up banners praising Thank all you. things American, heard Mr. Baker welcome Albania into the democratic community, which he said could now build a Europe free and whole with Albanian participation. He said he had come with a message from another free people, the American people, and the message was welcome back to the assembly of free peoples. Mr. Baker was expected to announce $6 million worth of immediate aid, which will provide emergency supplies of powdered milk and medical equipment. He also said the U.S. would help with the process of democratization in Albania by offering to develop democratic parties and providing assistance in the writing of the new constitution. But he also warned Albanians, whose economy is in an unholy mess, that the road to democracy and prosperity would be difficult as other new democracies in Eastern Europe have already discovered. Nelson Mandela has said that apartheid is not dead, even though its laws have now been dismantled. Black South Africans, he says, still don't have the right to vote. The first peace conference to include the government and the main black political parties has been held in Johannesburg. Just getting the ANC in Carter and the government together to discuss ending violence is a breakthrough. The churches pulled it off, finally breaking down months of hostility with a conference deliberately pitched below the level of top leadership. Nelson Mandela, Chief Boutalese and President de Klerk still haven't agreed a forum in which to meet to end years of mounting township warfare. So more junior officials hope to start the confidence building. Well, obviously, the fact that we are here shows that we are prepared to work together towards peace in the country. And away from the talks, Nelson Mandela made clear his agenda for the discussions. Not uh, to dig up uh, the ghosts of the past, but uh, to concentrate on the task of mending whatever wounds have been opened. Although township killings have declined substantially in recent weeks, the ANC still regard the violence as a major obstacle blocking constitutional negotiations to give the black majority the vote. Strategy in those talks is the major issue confronting Oliver Tambo, the ANC president back in South Africa, for his organization's largest ever conference in 10 days' time. The United Nations is planning to set up a task force to provide an immediate humanitarian response to international disasters. Unarmed troops from UN member countries could be summoned within hours of any disaster. It has been a year of disasters. The plight of the Kurds was largely man-made, and the belated response from the international community only added to the suffering. This relief effort had barely begun when thousands of miles away, lowland Bangladesh was ravaged by a cyclone. Over 100,000 were killed and a government with just six helicopters to its name was left floundering. Aid agencies were stretched by the twin emergencies and the first calls went out for some new force, similar to the UN's peacekeeping troops, which could deal with disasters rapidly. The plans revealed today exploit the logistic know-how of the military for humanitarian goals. While there will be support for this attempt to turn swords into plowshares, it won't provide all the answers. The difficulty, though, about this is that a force of this kind will be a tool. It will only be as effective as the operational plan within which it is operating. Now, this means that there must be effective coordination. I've just been down in Africa. Uh, I was appalled uh, in that continent by the way in which the international community has failed to mobilize enough food in time. Nearly 30 million Africans are still on the edge of starvation, some eight months after the first warnings of an impending famine. Only a portion of the relief that's needed has been delivered by donor governments. It's political will, as much as rapid deployment, that's needed to deal with this, the worst of all disasters. Talks in Madrid about the protection of Antarctica have broken down after the United States rejected plans to ban all mining on the continent. The Worldwide Fund for Nature accused America of jeopardizing the whole environmental protocol by delaying the signing of the Antarctic Treaty. An agreement to protect the future of Antarctica was expected to be signed tomorrow, banning all mining and oil exploration for the next 50 years. The area has vast mineral reserves and the Americans wanted the option of exploiting those resources left open. 
conservationists demanded a permanent moratorium with the entire polar cap designated a world nature park. A compromise was thought to have been reached, first in Chile and then in Madrid earlier this year. But the Americans walked out of today's talks, saying the 50-year ban was too restrictive, insisting they needed more time to examine the proposals, a move immediately condemned by environmental groups. We're appalled that the Americans have stonewalled this meeting all week to protect narrow national economic interests. It's a clear signal to other countries that mining in the Antarctic is OK. They want to mine, and what this will mean is that there'll be an increased presence in the Antarctic, increased environmental damage, and that'll undermine environmental protection. Already, industrial activity has brought pollution to the shores of the ice cap. Conservationists now fear that unless there's a change in American policy, this largely unspoiled wilderness will face further irreparable damage. Now, with news of a splendid fight back by England's cricketers and the rest of the day's sport, here's David Davis. Thanks to Robin Smith, England's cricketers have staged a remarkable revival in the second test match at Lords. They began the day in danger of losing by an innings. They ended it only 65 behind the West Indies, who must bat again tomorrow. After yesterday's all-too-familiar collapse, England today unexpectedly rediscovered the dogged resilience that characterised their win at Headingley, as Russell and Smith set off in pursuit of the initial target of 220 to save the follow-on. Smith, in particular, refused to let England's predicament constrain him, albeit helped by a pitch re-adopting the benign nature of the first day. Even when Russell went for 46, England's resolve remained intact, with Pringle confidently assuming the role of foil to Smith and further confirming his belated arrival as a genuine test all-rounder. The follow-on avoided, Smith earned his personal reward, a first hundred against the West Indies, richly deserved, desperately needed and mightily appreciated by his grateful teammates. Though he lost Pringle for an invaluable 35 soon after, De Freitas joined him in another fruitful partnership. And as West Indies' lead shrank below 100, so Smith's confidence blossomed to the delight of another capacity crowd. He'd made 148 when England were finally dismissed for 354. A deficit of only 65 represented a remarkable fight back by Smith in particular and England's unheralded tail-enders in general. Saving the match, an unlikely prospect this morning, now looks a distinct possibility. And in the county championship, Robin Smith's brother, Chris, became only the second man to reach 1,000 runs for the season, scoring 85 for Hampshire against North Hants. The former England fast bowler, Neil Foster, made 107 not out for Essex against Sussex. An innings of 172 not out in six hours by Andy Hayhurst gave Somerset a commanding first innings lead against Gloucestershire. The Spurs manager, Terry Venables, and the millionaire businessman, Alan Sugar, have taken control of Tottenham. Each of them is investing more than three and a half million pounds, but neither has been able to guarantee that Paul Gascoigne will stay with the club. At last, Alan Sugar and Terry Venables together at Spurs. Today's confirmation is 24 hours later than planned, thanks to another unsuccessful intervention yesterday from Robert Maxwell. Their assessment of the debt-ridden club's business prospects was upbeat, but on the possibility of cancelling Paul Gascoigne's £4.5 million transfer to the Italian club Lazio, there was deliberate caution. We don't know the state of play whether it's too far gone, whether, we're, whether there's enough money on the table or what, I really don't know. And Terry's got to sort that out next week. We would all be pretty stupid if we didn't want to keep Paul Gascoigne. There is two problems, as you say, unlike most businesses, there's, there's the shareholders and supporters. They're the two things, and sometimes they're the same. What we've got to make sure is that the position is good for everybody. Venable's undoubted popularity with the fans would be vulnerable if Gascoigne did have to go. Outside, as he posed with his new chairman, there came an ironic but hilarious double take. I'm here, leg here. Do you want a picture? My leg's better now. <laughs> the Gaza look alike as buoyant as the rest. The news today um, really puts the seal on it, and uh, this is the start of a, of a new era for Tottenham Hotspur. But on Gascoigne, the question remains Will Sugar and Venables please the fans, or the city, or both? Martina Navratilova has shown she's in form for the defence of her Wimbledon title by winning the Pilkington Glass Championship at Eastbourne. Her opponent, Arancha Sanchez Vicario from Spain, took a 4-1 lead in the first set. Game is Sanchez Vicario. 
but Miss Navratilova showed her depth of experience and produced strokes of the highest quality to overhaul her young opponent. The second set was almost a formality. Game set a match, Miss Navratilova. The score, 6-4, 6-4, Miss Navratilova's 10th title at Eastbourne. And that's the BBC News tonight. Good night. The Chancellor of the Exchequer, Norman Lamont, will be discussing the current economic situation with Jonathan Dimbleby when he goes on the record tomorrow afternoon at one o'clock here on BBC One. Good evening to you. Still no sign of summer. No wonder, no sooner do we get rid of that area of low pressure than another one's moving in to give us some more wet weather. Now at the moment we've got a fair number of showers across Ireland, across England, even some heavy ones with thunder. And they're going to continue to rumble on for a while, but eventually I think during the course of the night those in central and eastern areas will die away. They'll keep going in the west and in the north and late on in the night some wet and windy weather beginning to show up in the far southwest. There's the overnight temperatures. And there's the area of low pressure that's going to be responsible for it, zooming in during the course of tomorrow. Uh, the rain already into the far southwest spreading on across most parts of England and Wales and the area of low pressure itself tracking across the Midlands. So let's put some symbols on that. At the beginning of the day, as we saw a while ago, that rain into the southwest, into South Wales. And during the course of the morning, it's going to be spreading on through into central and eastern areas, and then in the afternoon into northern parts. And some of that rain is going to turn out to be quite heavy. It'll be windy with it. There'll be gales blowing along those coasts there. Just a hint, perhaps, of somewhat brighter weather arriving very late in the day in the far west. As for Scotland and Northern Ireland, and perhaps even the border counties of England, a different sort of picture. There'll be some sunshine, there'll be some brightness, but there'll be a fair number of showers around as well, and some of them could be quite heavy in that eastern part of Scotland. Temperatures again fairly miserable, although not too bad where it stays brightest longest in the east. The Gulf War convinced many of the need to control the export of weapon technology and arms sales. Panorama on Monday investigates how British arms manufacturers are responding to the new world order. Why did Chile's former dictator, General Pinochet, make a secretive visit to a British arms manufacturer last month? And what are the consequences of British involvement in the building of a high-tech weapons factory in the Middle East? That's Making a Killing, Panorama, Monday at 9.30 on BBC One. A merry mix of music and mirth comes our way in 50 minutes when Curtis and Ishmael are on the loose in Paramount City. The guests include EMF and Kathy Dennis. First, another busy and demanding shift awaits those in casualty.